<laughs> it is, it's been a really good week um, working with you guys and uh, seeing some of the work, but so I'm excited to see uh, what you did come up with. I know I, uh, I left Clappy at just a little after midnight last night and um, he stayed up and kept working quite a bit longer than that. So um, I'm sure that's the case for a number of you. So we're excited to see what you've got for us. Um, trying to figure out where to start, who to start with. I think we should start with the Inquisitors though. Are you, unless you have a problem with that. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yes, they can. Can you hear me? Okay, this will pick you. This yeah, mic will pick you. Mic and your speaker. speaker. And your speaker. Speaker and mic should be on. How's that? Okay, well, I'm going to share. It says I'm muted, though, but I guess I don't have to believe that. This is not my. This is not my. <laughs> Got it. Uh, let's see. So uh, we're a team inquisitor. That's uh, Cecil and I, but we're not from Spain. <laughs> 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 but uh, if you notice in my name there, it has a quiz in the middle. And so our goal was to build a uh, examination environment um, because of what I'm about to describe. Uh, so our project uh, actually involves my main work. It's not sure. This is Can you share screen you have to one? Oh. Yeah, is it Keynote or PowerPoint? PowerPoint. Oh, oh here. Does anybody know any technical people who could help us with a computer problem? <laughs> How's that? Hey, that's, that's a lot better. Uh, <laughs> uh, can can you read that? Because I can't. <laughs> it's easier up there. <laughs> Somewhat. Can you make it a little bigger? I, I can make it a little bigger, I think. I'm just on my regular monitor up top. See it all, but get most of it. It's all right. So uh, the the project that I'm working on at Unfolding Word is uh, to test out some concepts for bringing training content into Obsidian and out of Obsidian. And so this diagram shows the that environment. And I've added this item here for the uh, Inquisitor. Uh, to be able to get information out of Obsidian and then to display it. So uh, we've picked uh, Chamillo as our LMS uh, uh, pilot project, and it does fairly well at presenting material, but it's not really good at importing and exporting tests. And uh, testing will be a significant part of uh, training development. So for, for this project, we've built, we're building a test environment so that'll let you read your tests directly out of Obsidian, um, display them to a user and let a user take te test of training content. Uh, so uh, we divided the work up such that uh, Cecil is writing the code and I've been gathering the data. Um, Unfortunately, after we started this project, I realized that most of my work that's necessary for this is on my desktop at home. Uh, so I've had to cobble together some things and I just wanted to show you that process. It's not too bad. Uh, so realizing that the uh, Inquisitor is the uh, in environment to run the test, we have to be able to get the data out of Obsidian and a markdown, put it into JSON to be input for the test. Um, so uh, 
everyone's met Abel, right? Is he on the call? He is not. I've, I've just been in the All right. So Abel uh, developed uh, an API in Tremelo to let us get the test data out of. So in Tremelo, you can create content, you can create tests, you can export all the content, but when it exports the test, it's in binary. So that's uh, ostensibly to protect intellectual property. They don't want the test getting out to the students, right? Well, that's kind of the opposite of our goal. We want to make the tests available for people to use in the LMS of their choice. So we built an API to be able to get that information out and put it back in. And I just wanted to show you uh, this uh, Swagger interface, which is where you would be able to authorize yourself, get information um, out of uh, Chamillo. So this is a, a course right here, but the API supports uh, uh, many um, uh, points to be able to get data in and out related to training content. And down here are the testing uh, paths for gathering that information. So what I did while I was here is I used all these APIs and I sucked existing tests out of Tremelo. And then I built a, uh, a JSON file for our uh, testing. And and so uh, the environment we're using to develop is called, or the stack is called Elm. Uh, I don't know why it's called Elm, but it's a programming language that um, we investigated during the Learnathon. And it provides a server uh, environment for being, being able to access JSON files. So this is that server running. And right now I've asked it to retrieve all the questions. But if I just go to the home page, it says, well, here is all my testing information. So I have a list of courses and tests and questions and answers. So if I want to get to all the answers to all the questions, uh, just click on that and here's all the answers to all the questions. It doesn't make much sense when you're trying to read this, but this is the gist for the work that uh, CESOL has been doing. And uh, unless there are questions, which I'll entertain, I will pass this off to uh, Cecil. Okay. Uh, so uh, while, while Bruce was working on trying to, uh, to get the data, uh, I went ahead and, and basically uh, uh, kind of faked it, <laughs> faked the data in my application so I could go ahead and start working on the user interface. And so I developed a two question test, <laughs> two, both of them multiple choices. And, um, and essentially what you, what, you have, what you see on the screen is, is a kind of a, what that cut down kind of interface is. I don't have quite all the variables, but basically you have the, you have the test with its title, you have a series of questions. Each question has a series of possible answers and, um, and so forth. And then you continue to go from question to question. So it's fairly straightforward. So you click an answer to the question, then you hit continue, get your next question, click there, and that's basically it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but the idea is that behind the scenes, if it had time to hook it up together, I could have taken in his JSON, put it into my data model, which is under underneath this, uh, what's behind here, and, um, and, and it would basically uh, change according to whatever's in the JSON. So I basically hard coded as if the JSON had been imported and, and, and um, put into our, our data model that's uh, being used uh, for this application. That's it. Good job, you guys. Does this support the... Uh, okay. Wrong on mute button. Um, does this support uh, questions without answer? In other words, like essay questions, or is it really designed specifically for questions that can be checked by a computer? Well, Chamillo supports 
25 question types out of the box. Right. Some of them are essay, some of them are drop and drag, some of them are point and click. Um, we don't know, well, actually we do know, there's a, a pilot being done by our training department to determine the minimum number of question types to support. But I, um, most of the questions allow for an automatic evaluation, but of course there is an essay type and fill in the blank type that would require um, uh, an instructor to be able to evaluate. Uh, we, uh, this only, this example only supports one question type, which, uh, but in our first cut, we'll probably do five or 10 question types uh, for the proof of concept. Nice, thanks. Any other questions for inquisitors? Okay, I'm excited to have team diggers with us. So uh, Dima, or I don't know if you're the one speaking, but if you can introduce the, the team and, uh, and show us what you guys did. Yeah, so we have, uh... How many like four guys here mm -hmm. so victor uh alex alexander like shortly sasha so team and paul yeah we have four developers here mm -hmm. and uh we were able to develop like two projects so and uh, victor is going to show this um uh, two projects wonderful yeah we, we mm -hmm. the а меня слышно, да? Mm -hmm. Отлично. На этой неделе мы хотели сделать что-то по библейским картам. Yeah, yeah. This week we we wanted to create something for uh, Bible maps. Да, и в чате нам Тим Джори скинул карты библики, которые нам очень помогли. Yeah, yeah and, and Team Jory sent, uh, sent us uh, uh, maps from Bible. Biblica. Да, мы их конвертировали в SVG. Yeah, we converted them to ISVG format. Да, и ну как бы за эту неделю у нас вот два, скажем так, небольших proof of concept получилось. And, and we got uh, two proof of concept. Да, первый это конвертер SVG. Yes, yeah, so the, the one is uh, converter SVG converter. Да, на входе у нас есть карты. So, yeah, we have maps. Uh, да, mm -hmm. в которых есть текстовые поля различные. So, and maps have uh, some text uh, uh, fields. Uh -huh. Сейчас uh, покажу. Да, сами SVG, они очень, ну, очень много лишнего кода, но у нас не было времени их почистить. Yeah, SVG has some extra uh, code. Uh, we we didn't have enough time to clean it up mm -hmm. yet. Да, например, вот есть текст какой-то на английском. Yeah, for example, we have this text in English. Да, и мы написали небольшой код, который проходит все карты по порядку. Yeah, we wrote a, a, a little code uh, that actually parses all all the maps in in order. Да, создает TSV файл. And so it creates TSV file. Ну, с ID и с текстом. With ID and text. ID все, если вдруг название повторяется в другой карте, то ID шник, ну, у нее переписывается, чтобы мы имели текст в одном месте и во всех картах менялся он. Uh, еще раз можешь сказать, как? Да, если вдруг Иерусалим повторяется во второй карте, то айдишник просто перепишется. Yeah, if, uh, for example, Jerusalem repeats in the second map, so we will rewrite uh, ID of that. Mm -hmm. Да, и мы создали манифест файл небольшой. Yeah, and we created manifest file, a little manifest file. Да, для загрузки в GitDoor 43. So that we uh, uh, can upload to Door 43 web. Да, здесь, ну, как бы мы, он ругается на манифест, потому что здесь нет таких категорий, нет таких идентификаторов. 
Вот это просто... Yeah, uh, so, yeah. There are missing some cat categories. Uh, yeah, and so that's why we have some errors. Да, потом uh, то, что мы спарсили, мы загрузили в GitDoor 43. So, and uh, we, uh, what, we, what we got, so we, what we parsed, we uh, uplo uploaded to door 43. Mm -hmm. Да, это вот ну, первая библиотека, которая нам помогла uh, сформировать, скажем так, карты и текст. Yeah, so this, this is other library that help us to form the text and, and maps. Какая наша мысль была, что команда может сделать fork репозитория, и им достаточно маркс. TSV, uh, просто перевести. Yes, so our idea was that so uh, any other team uh, can actually uh, duplicate this uh, repository and actually translate uh, the text here, and that's mm -hmm. it. So cool. <laughs> wow. And мы сделали uh, viewer <laughs> для yeah. yeah, and also we made a, a viewer for maps. Да, здесь всего лишь три компонента. Первый компонент берет манифест, чтобы знать, yeah, какие компоненты. There are three components only. Uh, the first component is manifest. Да, он ну, получает манифест и берет название uh, карт. So he, got, he gets uh, uh, a manifest and actually uh, have a list of uh, maps, so different maps in да, the language. Да, круто говорит. Да, мы сделали вьюер, который отображает карту и заменяет вот по айдишникам текст. So, uh, yeah, we have, uh, yeah, we have in the viewer uh, map and uh, by ID, uh, so we got this text. А вот, например, вот этот айдишник, вот он здесь на русском заменяет. And so, yeah, it, it replaced, uh, yeah, it replaced uh, by, uh, you know, the language that you, you picked. Да, и мы сдел... ну, как бы объединили эти два компонента, то есть здесь выпадающий список, выбираешь карту, которая нужна. And, yeah, and here uh, we uh, combine two components together. И она подгружается с переводом уже сразу на русский. Yeah, so there is a list and map, uh, so you can see uh, all that together here. Да, но это, это всего лишь proof of concept, очень много нужно uh, ну, исправлять, то есть видите, текст не очень приводит. Yeah, yeah, it's just oh a proof of concept. Sorry, uh, what? I just said, oh my goodness, look at that, that's so awesome. <laughs> yeah, uh, so yeah, this is a proof of concept. Uh, there are a lot of things to fix and, uh, and adjust it so that more, да, more сам friendly. Да, но компонент, он получает, uh, получается, username. Uh, yes, so component user. gets uh, username. Да, и сам репозиторий. Если мы создали два репозитория, если поменять на английский, то тогда английские карты будут уже загружаться. Ну, на русском русские. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we can change uh, languages. Да, ну и uh, мы еще думали о редактировании СВГ. <laughs> ну, мы мож yeah. просто yeah. можем показать. Yeah, we also, like, started to work on our editor, SVG editor. Да, но это всего лишь, ну, это мы просто пощупали библиотеку SVG.js. Yeah, we just try to touch JS, SVG, SVG library. Да, мы научились линии рисовать. Yeah, we were able uh, to learn how to draw lines. Да, там uh, рисовать точечки. Yeah, put dots and lines. Рисовать кружочечки. Yeah, draw uh, circles. Да, и и ставить текстовые метки. Ну, мы думали, and, and also, что... Also put like this, uh, uh, text marks. Да, и это можно экспортировать, то есть, когда сохраняешь... Да, она yeah, сохраняется в you can, you can save that in SVG format right away. Да, мы думали, что, ну, что-то хотели придумать, чтобы создавать или, может быть, редактировать уже существующие карты, но очень много работы, yeah. то есть это вот, <laughs> это все, что мы смогли изучить. So the idea was like, okay, what if uh, people want to edit uh, existing cards or uh, maps or they want to create new ones? So, so, but it's just the start of that concept. So, yeah, we... да, ну, и Дима попросил показать то, что мы в прошлый раз делали. 
Yeah, and we will show timeline the 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 other project quickly. Yeah, yeah we uploaded to the Git. So the project name is timeline. Да, и в Netlify также сделали build. Но yeah, we, yeah, we uploaded uh, build on Netlify. Но это не он. But <laughs> this is a different one, just a moment. So. Не, не, okay. я, я не тот, который, оказывается, запаблишил из Сори. Че, локально будешь показывать? Uh, так, да. Можно, если минутку, я локально запущу. Mm -hmm. Я, оказывается, шаблон опубликовал в Netlify. Минуточку, извините. Sorry, one minute. Zoom tax. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, we showed this. Uh, uh, yeah, we showed this tool to our uh, translation teams and uh, checkers, so they like it. So they they said, yeah, we would like to maybe you know come up with the content. So this is a great uh, way to to show the stories uh, of the Bible in timeline. Would be useful for OLs. So we got a, a good feedback uh, for the prototype. So. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Yeah, we have manifest uh, here. Да, ну мы его взяли отсюда в наш компонент для карт. Ah, yeah, yeah. So we use the same manifest. Uh, so we we took this manifest and used in the maps as well. So it was a good. Yeah. Um, да, ну. Start for manifest, yeah. Дим, ну я не знаю, что показать. Мы то, что в прошлый раз показывал. <coughs> ну mm -hmm. этот. Uh, so yeah, idea is that. Uh, you can you can pick uh, you can pick uh, so you can create a timeline of different events so events that has uh, some dates in it or it can be no dates but we know in the Bible there are chron uh, chronological events so the people mm -hmm. uh, can uh, you know like uh, sh sh show them uh, you know in a chronological way so we have two different uh, views, horizontal uh, with the timeline and, and the content. So there are text and uh, uh, image, if there are image uh, that taken from, uh, you know, um, OBS, for example, or there, there is a vertical uh, mm -hmm. timeline, just the text. Mm -hmm. So there are different views of this timeline and uh, yeah, people mm -hmm. can pick. Ну да, и для него мы тоже создавали TSV, придумывали. Yeah, and yeah, so we, we create TSV for this uh, uh, tool. Yeah, that's it, yeah. yeah we, we have this uh, prototype, but we don't have content, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Ordo. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Really good job, you guys. That's, that's a lot of fun to see. So I have a comment slash question. It seems like that timeline plugin could be used for um, non-biblical things as well. Like you could show maybe the timeline of a project or something like that if you just fed in different data. Is that correct? Да, то есть он, Джесси говорит о том, что можно было вообще не только для библейских проектов, но и а, также, например, для каких-то прогресса проектов можно было бы использовать. Mm -hmm. Это правильно? Да, да, да. Это плагин, он, ну, это не мы сами его сделали, мы просто нашли в интернете, поэтому да, его для чего хочешь, все, у чего есть временные какие-то рамки, все можно yeah. использовать. Yeah, anything that has like uh, events by time or 
by order so that can be used so we took uh, yeah we took this existing and so we redo it for our purposes so yeah absolutely yeah cool project management idea right this yeah cool okay <laughs> <clears throat> okay, um, let's go on to, uh, oh man, I've, I've forgotten the team name all of a sudden, I knew it, Ray and CR, um, team Mark Howe and his uh, large, his giant team there. Hi, yeah, okay, so we just, um, Move a few things. I mean, not move a few things around. Um, I'll present my screen. Let's get that over there. There we go. And the hardest bit is always turning the video on, isn't it? Do, 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 do. Yes. Um, cool. Okay. So. Uh, Seeing your Discord, yep. I think. Yeah, yeah okay. Okay. Don't think that they've been compromising in there, but anyway, it's gone now. So. <laughs> um, yeah, great. So. Um, Diagesis reboot. It's the new new Diagesis. Um, Diagesis was the uh, program I demonstrated that some of you saw during the Learnathon. So um, doing browsing and um, searching of scripture of tables, syntax trees, um, and that's something I've been building out to try things out. As you saw, it works. Um, not ideal as a reference implementation because it was kind of a proof of concept that just kept growing. So the idea here is to rest basically reboot that um, project, re-implement the functionality using Ionic version 6, which has just come out for now, and more about that at the end, using Proscoma React hooks that clappy has been working on, and with a much cleaner model view controller architecture rather than everything just kind of thrown into uh, huge components. So the plan we had looked initially looked something like this. So an application, we have some state at the top, um, which gets, you know, it's basically being prop hoisted so that we can pass it into lots of things. Um, Chris um, Hubbard did some work looking at um, how to do caching, but in the meantime, we have a fetcher that pulls in data um, from a local server. I'll explain that a bit later. And then we have a number of um, pages and so um, each page has a page header where there's navigation, the title and things and Urban Tangency uh, worked hard on that, that turned out to be a harder problem to solve than I think any of us um, expected and Elias and Tom worked mainly on um, implementing some of the individual pages and then we didn't get to search and then towards the end, um, Rich, um, who was looking at um, print, we decided the easiest way to actually ship that was to add another page to it. So we kind of borrowed um, Rich from the Gutenberg team and he'll be demonstrating the print thing at, um, as part of this. So um, note to everyone on the team, by the way, if you can be ready to present and make sure you have the latest from the main um, branch, that would be great. So the data you're going to see is uh, data that I pulled from eBible. That's um, three New Testaments and three New Testament plus Psalms. That seems like enough data to test with. And I turned all of that into a 60 megabyte Base64 string via Diagesis. Um, and obviously Base64 compresses well. So just to give you an idea that those six New Testaments and, a couple, and three Psalms turn into 13 megabytes if you zip it. Um, and that's loaded from a local host server um, called Diagesis User Data, which is an, another one of my 59 long node servers. And when we get to print, note that that's the server that we're using to save the HTML that we generate um, onto. Uh, teamwork. So I was excited to try, the, um, try to get some useful information from GitHub about this. And I was pleased to see that our, our net production was minus 7,000 lines of code. So I definitely want to beat that. We've done all this functionality by actually deleting code, apparently. Um, I think that's because I removed the Proscoma dependency or something and the lock file probably got smaller, but anyway. Um, as you see, lots of, yeah, lots of people posting, lots of people doing things um, and so on. And so in terms of demonstrations, um, this is the running order, which hopefully everyone involved has. So over to you, Jinty.
share the screen. So for uh, navigation, uh, I would start with the UI. Uh, for navigation, uh, yeah, we have uh, we have done like drop downs for Bible, book, and chapter. Um, uh, for Bible, uh, like while clicking on the first drop down, uh, there comes the drop down for like uh, it's pop up now. So there comes the uh, drop down for Bible, uh, can uh, select any Bible and then comes the drop down for book where we can see all the books. Uh, so yeah, we can set it, set the state. Yeah, if there would be a drop down for chapter also. I think this is the one for book. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, this is the drop down for chapter. Uh, so we can see all the books, uh, all the chapters, which is there in uh, one Peter. Yeah, uh, for book also, we can see the books, what, whichever, which all book is in this English, uh, this Bible. So, yeah. Well, it's uh, the World English Bible. Uh, so yeah, World. it's the Eng English Bible. Um. Yeah, so uh, yeah, uh, to go with the code. So for the code, yeah. Uh, here we started with the code. Um, 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 yeah, for, uh, uh, for uh, initially we set, set the state um, uh, as, uh, as mentioned by Clappy in that Learnathon week. And uh, like uh, we gave, we gave a variable and uh, gave a object and uh, and set it to a nav state and passing and then we are passing set nav state to whichever drop down we want and set the book code chapter ch uh, verse chapters and the bible by uh, clicking on that drop down button. Uh, yeah, and yeah, for the, uh, for the navigation, we have used two main hooks like uh, use query and use catalog as mentioned by Mark. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah, uh, one is pending like um, the worst drop down is pending now. Um, yeah, no, I think, uh, uh, yeah, and for the uh, for the data of uh, what we are doing like um uh, so for the uh data uh the uh, there is a file share there was a file shared by mark uh, which we are, yeah, uh, uh, a zip file, uh, which we uh, just saved it to archive. Uh, yeah, this is the file, which is, sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, this is the file. Uh, um, we just get get uh, from where the dead data is coming, and uh, um, yeah, I think that that's all from my side. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, um, the um, book drop down and Bible drop down was done by like Raven and um, the rest uh, uh, the uh, chapter drop down and. Mm, the and yeah uh, the chapter drop down was done by me yeah that's from my side thanks thank you okay tom 
<clears throat> well, let me uh, just say that I uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, to work work with you you guys this week. Um, so starting last week at the Learnathon, I knew essentially no JavaScript and now almost none of the other technologies or tools being used. Um, so it's been uh, a, a real uh, drowning experience here the last two weeks. But uh, um, so working together some with Elias uh, this week, um, we uh, we worked, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show the chapter first because that's the first thing we worked on. Um, so this is the chapter view and uh, you can choose, choose a Bible. And of course the chapter and the verse, or I mean the, the book and the, and the chapter and, uh, and you know, whatever, whichever you selected up here in the, uh, in the, the selections that, uh, that Jinsi just showed you, um, you will then see that chapter of that book in that, uh, in that resource in the Bible. So um, did a little bit of work in cascading style sheets to get the uh, verses to appear in the poetry and to be, appear indented and things like that. And so um, then the versions, uh, we tried the new ion accordion controls and I know they're new because Mark told me that. Um, it's all new to me, uh, but uh, when you choose a, uh, a Bible up here, then that one automatically expands, but it's an accordion. So you can look at each one and for each one, it will show you um, the, the list of books available and the page header for that book in, in the vernacular, as well as any of the table of contents information that is available and uh, whatever's not available just gets hidden. So for this one, we have header table of contents two and table of contents three. And here's the code behind it. Um, so chapter, so basically there's kind of two parts to this. There's the, the query, um, the GraphQL query to get the data out of Proscoma. And, uh, and so in the query, we have these variables that are then replaced with the uh, information from the nav state. And then, the other part of it is, well, I guess it's really three parts. There's, there's then there's all the the structure to get the the, the page content for Ion, and then in, in the inside of that we have queries that uh, take the data that came back from the the, the query and turn it into uh, the specific elements that are needed to be able to display whatever content we're trying to show on that page. Um, so, and then for the the versions. They're in here someplace too. There we go. Um, actually, a fairly similar approach, um, but in this in this case, the, uh, the 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 structure is a little more complicated because of the the accordion stuff. Um, but a, but a similar idea with uh, the stuff coming back from from the doc sets and uh, turning that into an accordion and. Thank you, Ravant, for helping us figure out how to get the uh, the accordion to appear open uh, when it's when that that resource is selected. And uh, the way that is done is um, this accordion group here, which is the kind of the top level thing. Whatever its value is here, if that value matches the value of the actual accordion in the group um, here, then that's the one that will be expanded initially. Expanded as you select a different one. I think that's all I have to say, unless there's any questions. I'm maybe push on uh, Elias, could you um, maybe show us the verse page? Uh, so yeah, guys, uh, this is the verse page and what it does is that it shows you the same verse on all the different Bibles that we have for now and, and the different languages. So uh, 
Yeah, and when it comes to the to the code, it was pretty similar to the to the uh, rose capture chapter one. So first we have the query where we take the the data from the GraphQL from the archive that we had in the static folder that uh, Jinzi said, and then we replace it with the nav state uh, info. Uh, then we use the, the, we call the hook that Gappy created. Then we use all of these functions for, uh, yeah, for making the, the, for making show, to show all the, the Bibles in the different languages that we have for now. And down here is where we print it up. In this return, the, the ion uh, comp uh, complements. And this is where we print it out right here on the ion grid. So yeah, for me, uh, I'm really new to programming. So this uh, week was really helpful for me to understand kind of how React works and how we can use hooks, how useful they are how React components are used and how we can divide it in, in folders. And, and yeah, it was very helpful for me and, and to know uh, GNC, to know Mark, to know Tom and Revant. It was really good to meet them. So yeah, it was, it was a great time. Oh, thank you. So yeah, thanks. Very good, yes, very good. So in fact, you next it's me again. So I get to share my screen again. Not there we go. Right. So the book page. Um, this is using the Proscoma render model. So I essentially copied across what we had in Diegesis and then proceeded to take out as much as I could and still have something that works. So I mean, if you looked, um, <laughs> yeah, Revan did a um, um, uh, kindly. Looked at, reviewed one of my pull requests and found lots of things that were kind of hard to understand or weren't connected to anything and so on. Um, and that was kind of the problem with using this as an example. So what I've done now, as of this morning, is taken out basically all the code that you that does links to other places and scrolling and fancy stuff and just the stuff that renders HTML because I know that several people here want to try to understand that. So. I don't think I'm going to show you the code for this right now because it, it looks a bit like what Rich is going to show you maybe in a minute. But uh, just to tell you, that's there. That's, that's essentially 80 lines of code and about four um, callbacks that's doing all this formatting. And you know, we'd need more for the various use cases people have mentioned. But um, I think we now have a fairly good base from which to work on that. And without further ado, over to you, Rich. Thank you. All right. So kind of just leaving where Mark just was on the book view. Uh, the question is how to get that into or the what we wanted to solve with my project was the Google for team. Uh, and then I realized Mark had a platform, the uh, framework and everything that could make this easier to do was we added a print button down here, or Mark did, and added a print page here, and stuff here. But you see, we still have the navigation, and uh, it takes the Bible that we're viewing uh, and puts it into a Bible name. Now, the USFM for these Bibles doesn't have the actual you know, uh, name. So we first added a field here. It populates with that uh, Bible code. We could change it here. So world, English, Bible, British edition is what that all stands for. And uh, so you can change that. So in the PDF, it looks nicer than that ID. And then uh, you can choose what books of the Bible you want here. Uh, and right when we hit set, it will generate. It, this is a little preview down here, but it, it's uh, not. Uh, uh, doing everything like table contents, numbers, and footnotes. But what it also did, let me show you the code. Uh, so we're using React, um, using a, use a fact here. Uh, once we had the Bible name that I filled out, 
which also comes pre-populated. And the Bible book selected this triggers this to render. And that creates a config file for Prescoma that uh, uh, puts in the Bible books that you wanted and the Bible name for the title page. And, and that goes and then uh, does a whole render here for a uh, you know, PDF print, print preview render. And that sets our uh, Bible HTML that we have. And here's where it does the preview. Uh, this is a previewer from uh, PageJS. So we're using PageJS here, but it doesn't, it's not running the JavaScript that will populate the, the pages and everything. But what we do have is a print button over here. Uh, if you see on the right side here, better if this was <laughs> not so wide. But uh, if you hit that, it actually, another thing it did in the code was that it uploaded the HTML to, uh, uh, I guess it was like a server, web server here that we're running. And that actually populates here the table contents. So over here, you saw that here, but it actually got the page numbers. And you should pull down here and even did the footnotes and everything. And so you could currently we can do a print. This will look better. Got all that white there, margins. But uh, again, here's the title we put in there. Blank page and then the table of contents. And you have the uh, text and the footnotes. Wow. <laughs> so that's where we got on that. And so it'd be nice to also, you know, work this into translation notes or whatever into the footnotes and so forth. And so, yeah, the book selector can even choose all the books. Right away, it uh, generates a Bible with all the books that are available. Again, if you click over here. That was fast, Rich. <laughs> so still says rendering. Yeah. Over here and reload should be, yeah. be there yeah, it, as takes, well. it takes about a minute. It takes about a minute to um, actually populate. Um, the whole right. Thing. So you see here, this is oh, the job yeah. that PageJS does. They're coming in. Oh. It's figuring out all the pages for the print. Wow. That's impressive. <laughs> so cool. Let me see this together. Yeah, we'll get the maps. That's got songs in there. <laughs> can you put some maps at the end? <laughs> yeah, let's just put all the maps in, get the right languages in. <laughs> we're heading in that direction. That's where we're going. Localizing. That's what map. I had to share. So that's where we got this week on that. Let's see here. Good job. Okay. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's, a, that's good stuff. So, um, just to finish off, um, a few thoughts from, these are my thoughts, I mean, um, which, um, yeah, so, yeah, some, I mean, some random conclusions from this. Uh, we certainly found that Proscoma Freeze made startup a lot more fun. As you can see, we're pulling in um, six New Testaments in about five seconds. And so, um, yeah, as a deployment strategy, that seems quite interesting. When as Jinty also demonstrated as a, um, eyeballing the data strategy is not that great because it's a 60 megabyte string, but um, it certainly does load fast. Um, custom hooks are, hooks are cool. I mean, it's the first time, I mean, I kind of knew what they were and I'd looked at them. It's the first time I've tried to use them. And once I got my head around the idea, they definitely do make for neater code. And Clappy's custom hooks are very cool. Um, I mean, we only got to use three of them so far, but again, they made for a much neater code, a lot less boilerplate and also incidentally fixed some of the um, transpiler nightmare problems we were having. So that was good. Um, I think one thing we discovered is that Ionic is definitely mobile first and maybe um, desktop last. I mean, you may have noticed that the text um, doesn't, wasn't populating in the buttons that Jim C um, demonstrated. As far as I can tell, that's, a, that's actually a browser. I don't think that's our code because um, they come back even if you do things that don't run any code. So um, I think Ionic is very much mobilized for iOS and Android, and I suspect that their desktop stuff is a bit of um, a kind of an afterthought for developers, but we need to explore that some more. Um, one thing I noticed writing the code myself and looking at other people trying to write the code and then writing it and asking questions was, we need something like a post GraphQL JSON beautification library because um, GraphQL by 
because of its nature, doesn't necessarily give you back the most obvious, simple to access JSON. I mean, everything's possible, but you tend to end up with lots of arrays where you wanted an object and so on. And it seems like that seems like the other thing where everyone's solving the same problem. So I think if we came up with some um, a, a set of libraries that do things that, that basically turn around the data and make it easier to work with, that would be one more less layer of stuff that people need to write. And I think once we have that, we could look at building a Proscoma aware display RCL. So essentially, because the data is coming out of Proscoma um, in, a, in a consistent format, and especially if we can process it, we can start building a set of um, components that will do some of the things that you saw. And at that point, building the pages we have now would really be a series of import ports, a bit of kind of structure for the page as a whole. And then all the work just happens in things that have been imported. And Finally, and I guess kind of obviously, um, if people are working across in our ecosystem are working using different um, frameworks and so on, we might want to consider having more than one display RCL. And if we've actually managed to decouple all the, the model and the controllers and so on, then that seems feasible to me. So we could look maybe going forward at gradually developing the um, a display RCL in Ionic and developing a material UI one, for example, in parallel and then you could almost build the same app with either just by doing the outside framework and like i say reusing the equivalent components that plug in so that's what we have um thank you for listening uh, open for questions great job team um really good teamwork and any questions on this will you be able to make epubs as well uh, there's no, yeah, I mean, I, I already have an EPUB generator at the command line, so it would just be a question of doing essentially what I did in, I think, about two hours to get the uh, PDF one working. I mean, for what it's worth, the only thing I had to change was, previous, um, because it was a script, I was basically reading in a whole bunch of resources from the file system, and clearly that's a, a no-no in the browser. So, uh, but it's just it's just text. So essentially, I built, I built a module um, which um, contained all of those templates and exported them um, you know, so you can use them in the program and everything else worked out of the box. So yeah, we could absolutely do an e-port. Oh, that'd be a very easy thing to add on. Thanks. Rich, I'll ask you the question that the users are actually going to ask as soon as they see the printout, which is, can we make the secondary title italicized? Um, that's the <laughs> <laughs> they'll look at how beautiful that is and then they'll want some fine detail uh, changed and um, so the better you make it uh, uh, but it, that all points to just how how thorough it already is um, so thanks for doing that any other comments or questions it's just amazing to see all that under one roof. Yes, yes. But starting to tie and chain these things together, um, using the hooks, taking advantage of those, uh, very important. And then, um, Mark, I really appreciate your comment there, having the, about needed, you know, what RCLs uh, are needed next kind of thing. Um, that's, that is great to see, and um, hopefully we'll see those those RCLs this year. Um, it'd be really good to see those uh, completed. So uh, let's see. We need to move on to animals. 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 All right. We need. You needed the character from was it Muppets or Sesame Street? Animal. Oh, that's me. Uh, Cookie Monster or something. Don't distract him. Spend <laughs> hours trying to find the right. Uh, okay. Animals. I will make sure the animal that I did find. There we go. <laughs> yes, that's there we go. The one. We are team animals. <laughs> we all are the same Muppet. Um, and uh, we all play different instruments, though. Uh, <laughs> so our our goal this week was to take WordMap. It was um, 
basically engineered about four or five years ago with hopes and dreams to improve it. And it's kind of sat on the shelf. And we, we had about five different ideas on how we might improve the word map output using neural networks. And uh, we have a few team members that all have different um, experiences and different uh, attempts at what they tried to do this week. And our stretch goal was actually to be able to pull it all together and, uh, <laughs> and have something um, all inclusive like uh, what the last team had. Um, what we do have are lots of cool things that ran in parallel. Uh, and they, all, they were all very productive and um, hopefully post hackathon we'll be able to pull them all together because they all showed great promise for what they, what they can do. Um, the Muppet is not really a part of it, <laughs> so I'm going to hand it over to, who did I say I was handing it over to first? Joshua? Joshua, if you can give us a little bit of an overview of uh, the data and workflow that you had. Can I just say bringing Joshua in was like bringing in a like a designated hitter, you, you had a, <laughs> <laughs> an all star that you uh, yeah. ringer that you brought in on your team. Thank you. Um, so basically, I'm not sure how much everyone's familiar with word map. I'm assuming probably everyone knows about word map, and except for me, uh, <laughs> at the beginning of this hackathon. <laughs> Basically, WordMap uh, uses a bunch of really cool statistics to be able to suggest which words map to which words from the source to the target language. Um, so you can line things up and verify um, the quality of the translation. So um, uh, the current state of WordMap is that once all these statistics have been generated, all the statistics need to be joined together into a single confidence score. And uh, those are manually tuned with magic numbers, which are baked into the code. So that works for um, Greek to English, but then if you try to target a different language, you have to readjust those numbers um, to make it work uh, better. So our thought is, what if we replace those magic constants with a neural net? So um, I went and pulled up a, well, first we had to get the data in a format that we could throw at a neural net. So uh, we wrote a script that would process all the raw statistics that um, WordMap produces. And we used a book of Ephesians and then we manually pinned the output, the confidence score to what uh, the manual alignment for the book was. So the statistics were all raw, uh, no human involvement in the statistic generation, but then all the outputs were manually pinned to what they're supposed to be. And then we generated a CSV file with that. And so collecting all this data was uh, interesting and it took a lot of different people pulling together lots of different JSON files and then stitching those the data together into the CSV file was interesting as well. But then I used a machine learning framework called, uh, yeah, what's it called? The second. That the auto ML? Well, what it is is auto ML, but that's not the name of the library. Uh, I think it's called auto phi torch. So um, what that does is you say, okay, you're allowed to use this much RAM and you're allowed to use this much time on the clock. Here's the data, knock yourself out. And so then it tries like, uh, oh, we looked like it was maybe eight different models. And then it also rummages around with hyperparameters. And then I think it comes, picks its best couple of models and then merges their output. So I'm going to share my screen now and show what it produced because it produced some interesting results. All right, share screen. Where's the button? It's not reaction, not record. There it goes. Share screen. Desktop two. 
All right. Um, let's see. All right. Can you all see what's on this, uh, a graph with a bunch of dots? Yes. Okay. All right. So um, we just, this is a Jupyter notebook. I pulled in our CSV file and then I split it into testing and train data. Um, and then I basically threw it at the model and I said, do a search. And so then it runs and then every now and then there are random explosions as different models blow up and then the auto ML framework kills them. And then it picks the best ones it likes. And I went ahead and graphed the results right here. So on the left, are the ones that should be low and the ones on the right are the ones that should be high. So the false positives are in the top left quadrant and the false negatives are in the right bottom quadrant. Um, but you can see there is a distinct um, highlight of different uh, positives here that are correct. So this shows in, in the word map algorithm is iterative. So if you can get a whole chunk of correctly identified positives, uh, you can map those and then uh, iterate and you can have a whole lot better matching. So I went ahead and looked at what the false positives were over here. And a lot of them actually are positives. They're not actually false. They're just not what the human translators picked uh, for their mapping. So like, here's some examples of quote unquote false positives. Um, uh, so let's see. Um, like you can see here, Christos was, it said Christos should be mapped to Christ, which is correct. But if you go look in the actual translation, uh, the actual mapping that they, uh, human translators selected was the Christ instead of Christ. So then that meant Christ was a false mapping, but then the map still put it as a high possibility because it is. Um, I did look through here and there was one here that was incorrect. This one is beloved and it thought it should map to children. So that one's incorrect, but a lot of these other ones are actually correct. Um, we, uh, Chris, should I go ahead and continue on talking about how we try to simplify this and, or should we hit, put that over to another uh, person to share? Uh, it, which part of the simplification? Okay, well, this is, like I said, this was part of an auto ML framework. So it, um, eventually what we're going to do is pull the model back into word map. So it's running in a browser. And since this is a whole bunch of machinery and it's a little bit black box, we were wanting to use this as saying, this is possible, but let's try to do it with a smaller model. Yeah, yeah, that, that's good. Um, you know, it, it's also important to point out that uh, the building blocks for this are a very small book with only about 150 verses. And it was producing fairly decent output. Uh, for such a small data set. And our, our thought process is it's easier for us to iterate. And if, and if we can get somewhat usable output out of something as small as Ephesians, we should be doing pretty good once we go, get to bigger books and combine more than just one book uh, of training data. Um, there was um, a reality that WordMap has just some random numbers it makes up based on the statistics it finds in the verses and the patterns it sees in the overall data set of frequency of how many times this word occurs. It's not intelligent about, you know, when you saw that word mapping to children versus beloved, most likely it saw the exact same patterns and statistics of where beloved and children occurred in the data and the patterns look the same. So if we were to have extra features that we bake into this data, because there's a lot of information we have about the Greek. And I'm going to hand it over to Mike to talk about what he was working on in parallel uh, to what Joshua was working on when we stopped. That was an impressive transition. <laughs> 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 
Um, yeah, so one of the things that I've learned in the past couple of years uh, from people that are much smarter than I am is that uh, it's prudent to find ways to take advantage of all of the information that we have about the source texts that we're trying to translate from. Uh, yes, we are tr often trying to do AI and machine translation for languages that don't have a ton of resources out there, except the things that we're trying to translate we know a lot about. In a lot of cases, we have complete syntax and morphological information for the whole text, which is not normal uh, when people are researching machine translation usually. So uh, some of the uh, false positives that Joshua showed were, as he mentioned, they're things that look like correct mappings, where you have like the article in Greek being translated as the in English. Um, but the reason that they came out as uh, incorrect, according to the model, is that there is a subjective angle to how one does alignment. When you go to align uh, words and a verse from one language to another, you have choices that you have to make about where the different words go. So in Greek, uh, one noun will have an ending that denotes how it functions in the sentence, whether it's the subject or the object or something like that. And morphology data can actually tell us what that is and potentially train a machine to make uh, guesses that are closer to what humans would make. So when uh, there's a Greek word like Christos that is in the surface form Christu, which means of Christ or from Christ, uh, if we can tell the machine, for example, that this is a noun in the genitive case, it might see enough uh, examples of that happening where it actually guesses of Christ rather than guessing that that should just be translated Christ. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. That was a lot of jargon. But so what was I, I was trying to do was take morphology information, in this case from the UGNT, uh, and it just comes as like a string where uh, it's like a comma separated list of abbreviations that represent all the information that we have about that word, whether it's singular, plural, feminine, masculine, all that kind of stuff. So I wrote some code that takes that uh, morphology string, passes it through some existing code that unfolding word has to give a more human readable list of the attributes and then take those attributes and transform them into a huge set of Boolean flags that AI uh, models could train on. So you end up with this huge long list of every possible morphological attribute. And for certain words, uh, they would be, the flags would be flipped to true and that would help the machine figure out, hey, in this case, you know, maybe in English, not only the noun should be translated, but the word of should be in front of it or something like that. Uh, so I wrote the code to do that. And then we started exploring some other things that are gonna be listed today. And we didn't really have the, uh, the computing power or the time to see how those features would impact machine translation that Joshua showed. But I think there's definitely some, based on the initial results that we saw, adding more features did help. So uh, I think there could be some promising applications in the future of adding morphology and syntax data to the machine training mix. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very promising feature that I really feel if we just had like one or two more days in the hackathon, we could have brought all of that together and had something functioning. Um, it's what the weekend is for, right? <laughs> well, I asked for an extension last night, but I didn't get that. You can extend your hotel stay. <laughs> uh, so the, another feature that we were working on in parallel, uh, Bruce McLean was working on taking all those hyperparameters and the different things that Joshua and Mike were talking about and testing with flags, um, using those almost as, um, I guess, input weights that we can run yet another neural network on to try different, using different features or using different weights. And I'm gonna hand it over to him to talk about how that could impact the, uh, the scoring in the end. Yeah, as Clappy said, just kind of a different, different approach making use of the 
existing word map uh, algorithm, one of the first things had to do was in the parameters that pass into word map as being able to pass in what weighting to use for different for the different engine weights. So, so basically made a enhancements to, enhancement to the existing word map to be able to initialize it with uh, the engine tuning parameters. And then, and so, oops, my problem is the tab is right over where I'm wanting to click on things. Okay, there we go. So created a, created a word map uh, wrapper, a wrapper for word map that would just, so for each iteration, you just plug in different, pass in different tuning parameters, and then it would go through, initialize the load the alignment data and the initial corpus, the target and source text basically, and then run the predictions. And then after doing the predictions, going through and calculating an error squared result. So basically it allows you to adjust parameters, hoping to lower the error squared as far as and the error squared is just comparing the, uh, the predicted alignments versus the original alignments that were already made. And so then, so that function is then going to be passed into this uh, learning function, this linear regression function. And in here, I was making use of I'm making use of TensorFlow.js. And in this, you set up, uh, so the, I'm using the first pass, I was just gonna test with using this alignment position engine weighting. And so I create a, a TensorFlow variable. And by variable, they mean something that the algorithm, that TensorFlow will change, will modify to see what effect it has on the error. And then, so initialize, initialize, create this optimizer. And then, you know, I just have a loop here that iteratively makes a call to a minimize function. And in the, and the minimize takes as a parameter, a function. And the function is just gonna generate an, a loss, you know, an error, not a, yeah, an error uh, squared method. And so here I'm calling, when I, the error function I passed in was back here. It's the, it's this iterate word map. Nope, excuse me, not exactly. It's this word map error function, which wraps iterate word map and saves the results and returns an error squared. Okay, so in, so I'm repeatedly calling that with the current value that TensorFlow wants to try as the alignment position value, and then take the error squared that I convert back to a TensorFlow scalar, and then return. Now, I got all the way up to this part and then got an error. And the error is because TensorFlow wants the functions that it's evaluating to be written in TensorFlow, i.e. using TensorFlow vectors, TensorFlow operations, you know, like matrix adds, matrix uh, addition, subtraction, squaring thing. And so that was kind of a roadblock. I thought I could get around it by, and part of that is because TensorFlow is moving a lot of these calculations into the GPU. And so where, and so the problem is word map runs on the CPU. So I thought, well, maybe I could switch TensorFlow to use the CPU as the back end, but still no, because their, their CPU operation just kind of emulates the GPU. So uh, what it didn't really like was me trying to get extract the data, TensorFlow data for this alignment position back into a normal uh, normal JavaScript variable, doing the calculations, 
for a book, finding the error of trying to re predict the alignments for the entire book, which in itself takes about 20 seconds, and then converting back to errors. So that was a roadblock that I ran into. And as I was thinking about it, really, I shouldn't have been trying to use TensorFlow for this because it's more meant for a wrapper for machine learning neural networks. Yes, they have this linear regression, but that could be done using a JavaScript library, a plain vanilla JavaScript library, which I did was able to come up with one of those, but just ran out of time to, to pivot to using that. So yes, it does. I don't know what the promise would be yet because I haven't actually been able to execute it one time, but it does look promising that I'd be able to get uh, see or at least start testing to see if there's meaningful data. And the, but the whole goal was to try, hopefully trying to leave the existing uh, word map method going because it's pretty efficient as far as math operations and it doesn't have, but then hoping to find the optimal tuning for those, for those parameters that it takes. So back to you, Clappy. Well, thank you, Bruce. Um, we do have one thing to share now to wrap it up. So we spent most of our time trying to get machine learning in the browser running. And there's a lot of libraries that are um, out there with grand promises that it's the easiest to use machine learning library. And it was five years ago and then they abandoned the project. Um, so we keep running into those problems, uh, but we found with some lost sleep, you can get some of them running in your browser too. <laughs> so uh, if I can pull open this right here, um, we have word map running. This is default output from word map. And then I did get brain.js up and running and did uh, what Joshua described to where it uses uh, word map for about 80% of the way there, gets all the permutations. If you remember, we got 150 verses in Ephesians. Uh, to get all the permutations, we have over around 100,000 permutations of possible alignments through those few 150 uh, verses. So we have 150 verses, but our permutations grows to, to about 100,000. So word map does all these operations on 100,000 possible alignments and then tries to guess which ones are applicable for that verse and projects those as our suggestions. So with a brain.js approach, we took all of those possible permutations, ran it through brain.js using a neural network to train and learn off of previous alignments saying, here's all the possible options, learn which ones got used by the aligner, the human aligner. And we did that until we got a nominal error rate. And then we sent it back to WordMap to take the best of all the suggestions, eliminate all the conflicts, and then find the next best of alignment suggestion and just iterate through that until we have as good of a word coverage as we can. So the interesting thing is it looks very similar to the raw word map output, which is actually a good thing because as Bruce stated, this is well oiled for English to Greek. So, um, starting off with something very good um, and close to word map is actually fairly impressive because this neural network learned off of very little data. So if I click refresh, here's where it's, it loaded the training data and is training. And you can see the output of the training data uh, right there. There's 50 iterations. And running Zoom at the same time uh, <laughs> takes a while. But there's uh, 100 iterations, which is very shallow. Like, I'm, if you do any machine learning, 100 iterations of, of training and tuning is, is so little 
and 150 lines of corpus is considered no corpus. So the fact that it's inferring getting this close to usable output on such little data, on such short training, is uh, quite exciting to see this good of an output. Now, if we were to tap into Mike's output and plug that in here and have morphology, it would be, I mean, I can only imagine what type of uh, improvements we'd see here. In addition to that, there's a lot of hyperparameters that we could be training and tuning with McLean's uh, linear regression approach. And um, I'm excited to see this project uh, progress because I, I really feel like this is the direction that WordMap is headed. So uh, any uh, naming suggestions for WordMap moving forward uh, will be appreciated so we can rebrand it. And right now it's just going to be like word map plus plus for now. <laughs> uh, but that is that is what we've got. Uh, it was fun and exciting and um, lost hair, uh, hair grade. And uh, as we all sleep, trying to get this to run in the browser. But, uh, we, we did we did succeed and we got a lot of progress on our stretch goals. Yes. My printer says brain map. <laughs> brain map. <laughs> that sounds perfect. Any questions for the animals? I have a question. Have you, is it, we, we all know that, or most of us know that the original languages have a lot of morphological data, but are, do any of the gateway languages have this as well? And could we use that kind of information to assist in translating to other languages. So, I mean, we do have, everything applies from the, uh, you know, the original language. So that's helpful in all the languages. Um, there's good existing known models for English and many other of our gateway languages that we could leverage. Even just using to fall out of the box, state of the art, uh, part of speech taggers, we could infer the same type of information for most of the major languages with over 90% accuracy. And it's not that we're basing all of our, we're not, we don't have to trust the accuracy of that. It's just a data point that right. gets fed into it. So that, that would be a huge help to the data, to the output as well. My hunch would be that as a translation becomes more dynamic, uh, trying to correlate morphology between the two language pairs would probably become less helpful because the choices would be less consistent uh, and less mapping directly. But in really literal things, it might be pretty helpful for like a language of wider communication that has those tools like Clappy was mentioning. Cool. Oh, are you meaning like a literal translation versus you know, uh, you know, what's the other word? The paraphrase. Yeah, yeah well, not yeah. even a paraphrase. A more dynamic translation will probably vary more in the way that it translates certain terms to fit the context. And so there could be more variation even from the different parts of speech, for example, that are used. And so those correlations might not be as helpful in that case, but it's definitely worth checking out, if not only for the literal translations. It sounds like it fit well in our translation model to generate a literal translation. Yeah. Because we need that in the GLs, but you could at least get that part pretty close. Hmm. Well, thank you guys. That was yes. very, very good. Um, I wish I could give you a couple more days, but. That's up to God. So <laughs> I'll pay for the hotel. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, we're going to pause the recording for a moment and move over to. Um, I think what we had, uh, uh, I think Chris helped us find the name uh, Gutenberg, right? The idea was uh, the scope or the goal was to produce. Uh, or allow GL teams to produce drafts of their Bibles, right? 
And uh, I've, I've been working on an approach that's a little different is that it's server side as opposed to in browser. And uh, that has some pros and some cons. Uh, so just to stop, start at the top right here, uh, are you seeing a slideshow with one, two, three? Yeah. yeah. So at the top right, of course, we've got the end user running, uh, let's say DGSys or something like that, or the DGSys reboot uh, in, a, um, uh, in a browser. The difference here is this section two here is that the PDF would be produced on the server, right? Server side. So um, uh, I can explain that approach in a little bit. The content would still come from DCS, right? So we're pulling DCS content from, uh, you know, by URL from, uh, uh, you know, pull a USFM content from DCS. And here's the approach I'd like to talk about. It's a little different. Um, we had some existing command line tools and I think on Monday I said, um, that's why I'm an engineer and not an academic is because I'm just going to steal code and reuse it. So um, if you think about how easy it was to use the existing command line tools to uh, just basically pipe together existing tools to produce page JS, HTML, and then PDF, that's what I was trying to reproduce uh, on the server. So uh, it's, it's not complete. Um, I, I didn't get as far as I wanted. But this, this uh, area right here is uh, the part I'd like to talk about. So uh, Amazon has announced, you know, um, and other vendors will follow, I'm sure. Uh, uh, Amazon's one of them that in certain regions, you can host Docker containers as an AWS Lambda layer. So Lambda is uh, what they're calling serverless, uh, you know, a serverless product, which it's just like, you know, what do they say about cloud? It's just someone else's computer. Right, same thing. Serverless just means it's just someone else's server. But the the benefit of Lambda is it's not like a VM running, and it's not like uh, some traditional web apps running, where really the costs can be kept low because it's um, there's certain constraints that the host will put on your code, uh, and that translates to um, to the programmer in uh, or the solutions provider in terms of lower cost. So AWS Lambda just think is is um, uh, a way that we can host uh, server-side code, you know, processing code that uh, keeps the cost at a minimum. The benefit here is if we're using Docker, uh, which Docker is just a container solution that I can take basically my uh, development environment and host it up on a server is basically the easiest way to think about. It. Is that an accurate way to describe it, somebody? Um, some of these tools uh, were new to me. And um, um, it's, it's exciting to get into it. Uh, I, there's some pros and cons, and I, we can discuss those. But the idea, again, is this. As simply as I could produce a command line script to pipe together those um, individual components, I have uh, a file system and uh, can pipe together scripts just like I would run on the desktop. And as easy as that is to do on the desktop, uh, you can uh, just wrap it, wrap it in an API call. And so it, to, to go back a step, um, the RCL, and I didn't get far enough to develop the RCL, but the RCL would uh, uh, communicate here uh, to the API just to, just to get basically status, right? Uh, which you know, could be done just like we're doing all the other API calls, but the output would be PDF. I got as far as just producing HTML, but, um, but the idea is this, we have these existing components, Proscama render PDF, which can be used at the command line, page JS CLI, which can produce the HTML, which is the same HTML we saw in the DGSIS reboot uh, with the name I can't pronounce. Uh, and the third step here, and I didn't get to this, would be to take that page JS formatted HTML and render it as PDF. Um, uh, Mark, how was very helpful um, in navigating how the code works and um, you know how to configure it. Um, uh, I, I believe PageJS can can do this third step here for us is producing that uh, uh, PDF output. Um, in terms of just the environment or pipeline, is that clear? Does anyone have any questions?
And uh, next I'll switch to just a short list of pros and cons. And I, I think this is why um, this approach may be at least worth considering, right? Is uh, one of the benefits of server-side processing, right? Hosting it in a hosted environment would be, we. I would say we have more control uh, and quality assurance over the rendering, right? You're not limited to uh, the capabilities of the user's browser, right? It's a consistent environment that's repeatable um, and you would get the same output, you know, deterministically each time. Um, it, it, um, the solution I mapped out in the previous slide makes use of what I'm calling commoditized solutions. Uh, literally the only code was this batch script here and then um, eventually to implement some sort of UI um, to wrap it. So, uh, you know, uh, Mark, Mark boasted a couple of times, hey, this is 80 lines or so. Well, this is just a few lines here, bash script to pipe together these, literally just plugging it, plugging it into Lambda with the new feature again of, of being able to wrap it in Docker. Um, and there's um, uh, reusable open source solutions where people have provided ways to pipe in Lambda to Docker containers, uh, a Docker layer. So that's just a commoditized solution, just off the shelf, plugging it in. Uh, and then um, uh, wrapping it in turn in an API gateway, again, is a commoditized solution. It's a, it's a point and click solution with no code, no new code. So is that clear what I'm calling commoditized solutions? Lydia, I'm that, taking, sir. Can you, uh, we've got a couple more minutes and then I'm gonna have to cut you off, so. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, the con of that, again, is that would require someone, either some central host or the GL team themselves, to host the server-side the server side component, right? Uh, if we were to consider that part of DCS, that's additional cost, right? Uh, if the GL team wanted to host their own, that's additional cost. Uh, and again, just more moving parts, right? Additional components. Um, steps left, again, as far as I got was producing the HTML. So the next step would be again to, to that third step of converting HTML, the page.js HTML to PDF, uh, and then uh, some sort of UI to allow the user to do that. Uh, currently, you know, if you were to invoke it in curl, you could get, if you were to just, you know, invoke it over the command line, you could get HTML out. Uh, and then um, um, the content right now, the USFM, in, uh, in the examples is just hard-coded USFM, but uh, theoretically, right, in the model, uh, in the diagram I provided before, we could um, impersonate the existing DCS user, and, and uh, I'm not sure, uh, I, I, my understanding is that would work, because if we can pass the, the um, user's token to the AP, to the this, uh, processing server, process, uh, pass the user's DCS token, to the processing server, then the processing server could impersonate uh, the current, um, uh, which is like what we do in TC Create, where the app uh, operates as the user with their DCS API key. Um, so again, just to sum it up, it's different in the previous approach is that the processing is not done in the user's browser and um, uh, the output, th there's some you know magic server in the cloud that would produce this downloadable PDF file. Decrease. Any questions? Any questions, guys? So, so this would be suitable for pre-rendering a bunch of books for download and print. That was a question. Uh, pre-rendering, yeah, you could. Um, I hadn't, I hadn't implemented any kind of caching, but you could, I mean, that would be one option, right? Is it to, yeah, pre-render it and cache it, and then you could serve it up that way. Yep. So, Zach, we could try part of this very easily with what we built, because we do have a server, uh, which we just use to solve the problem of how to get a link to HTML to display on the screen. So currently we have like a three line thing that reads in the HTML, saves it out to a known location, and then the React thing goes to the known location and displays it. So we could easily add another two lines of code, which would which actually ran 
page.js CLI on that HTML, and then the React thing could link to the PDF rather than the HTML. So that wouldn't be your entire uh, system, but we could certainly test out the page.js CLI um, moving parts almost trivially, I think. And is that, Mark, because you have this Node.js server already running in the background? Yeah, exactly, which is really doing almost nothing. I mean, at the moment, it just takes anything you give it and saves it. It's the world, it's a kind of a one huge um, security hole, really. But let's say we could add in another few lines and um, actually do the PDF and return that instead of the HTML. Okay, thank you, guys. Um, yeah, this is, this is good work. And um, it's a lot of this is that kind of last step uh, and we're, you know, part of this, a big part of this hackathon was those missing pieces. And a lot of people want to know, how am I supposed to, you know, I know I can get this on door 43 and I know I can see it in HTML, but how am I actually going to print this off and, and hand it to somebody? So, um, all that is, is very, very important and, and good to see. Okay. Uh, Bincy is going to share a link in the chat. Uh, for a survey, I believe. Just a minute. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I posted it on the chat. Um, okay. Yeah. So if you could take a few moments here, um, I'll give you four minutes to uh, to fill this up and. <laughs> Thank you. 